Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. When my wife and I bought our first house last year, we were thrilled. It was in a nice, quiet neighborhood with big backyards and plenty of space between the houses. Our backyard butted up against our neighbor Judith's, with just a chain-link fence dividing our properties. Judith seemed friendly enough when we first moved in. She'd wave when we saw her outside, and even brought over a homemade casserole to welcome us. But it didn't take long for her true colors to show. The first sign of trouble came a few months after we moved in. I was doing some gardening in the backyard when I noticed Judith standing at the fence scowling at me. When I said hello, she snapped, You're planting too close to my yard. I looked down. My tomatoes were still several feet from the fence. No, I'm well within my property line, I said politely. Judith grunted and stomped off. Strange, I thought. A couple weeks later I came home to find Judith in my backyard, measuring the fence with a tape measure. Oh, hello, I said, startled. Did you need something? Just checking this fence, Judith muttered, not meeting my eyes. It's not quite right. I assured her the fence was exactly on the property line, then not so gently steered her back to her own yard. These encounters left me scratching my head. Judith clearly had some issues with boundaries. Things finally came to a head one Saturday morning. As I enjoyed my coffee on the back deck, I spotted Judith skulking along the fence, can of neon orange spray paint in hand. She glanced around furtively, then began spraying a line onto my grass, about two feet into my yard. I leaped up and raced outside. Judith, what do you think you're doing? She jumped, then tried to hide the paint can behind her back. Oh, I was just marking the real property line. This fence must have been installed incorrectly. I shook my head in disbelief. That is most definitely not the property line. You're spraying paint all over my lawn. Judith thrust out her chin. No, I had it surveyed. This is where it should be. We went back and forth, voices rising, but Judith refused to back down. Finally, I said, That's enough. I'm calling a surveyor to set this straight. Judith crossed her arms. Fine, he'll tell you I'm right. A few days later, the surveyor arrived. I held my breath as he examined the fence, compared boundaries, took measurements. Finally, he turned to us. The fence is exactly on the property line as described in both your deeds, he said. The orange paint is over the line encroaching on your neighbor's property. Judith's face turned an interesting shade of fuchsia. The surveyor gently suggested she refrain from spray painting her neighbor's grass in the future and took his leave. I turned to Judith. I'll give you a chance to clean up the paint yourself, but if you don't, I'll have to hire someone and send you the bill. For a moment it looked like she might argue, but finally Judith swallowed hard and nodded. The next day I was pleased to see the orange paint was gone, though Judith never did apologize. After that she avoided me like the plague. Guess she was embarrassed about being caught red-handed encroaching on our yard. But I worried she harbored some weird grudge against us now. Sure enough, a month later I awoke to find rotten eggs splattered across our front porch and car. What was this, middle school? I cleaned up the mess as best I could. Thankfully, the security camera on our porch caught Judith lobbing the eggs from the sidewalk in the dead of night. My wife and I decided we'd had enough of Judith's antics. After talking to a lawyer, we sent her a cease and desist letter, telling her to stay off our property or we would pursue legal action. I also shared footage of the egging with the homeowners association president, who agreed to keep an eye on Judith. Finally, we got some peace and quiet. Judith still glowers from afar sometimes when I'm gardening, but seems unwilling to cause more trouble after being caught on camera. My wife thinks we should extend an olive branch, maybe bring Judith some cookies. But after the stunts she pulled, I'm happy keeping our contact to a wave hello from across the fence. Here's hoping the legal threat keeps Judith's entitlement and trespassing tendencies at bay. She may hate me for stealing two feet of her yard, but too bad. I'm just happy to enjoy my property in peace. The next one is a pro-revenge story. My folks moved to a very rural area on a gravel road. No one had previously lived here, so it was a battle just getting mail delivery in the first place. My folks went several rounds with the local postmaster, he was somewhat enamored with his own power and very much a rules-to-the-letter kind of guy. Every I must be dotted, every T crossed, and if there's so much as a semicolon out of place, you'll have to start all over again. 
He seemed to have made it his personal mission to make getting mail delivery to a new address as difficult as humanly possible. Ultimately, my folks managed to fill out the paperwork to his satisfaction, and he begrudgingly allowed us to put up a box and receive mail delivery at our new home. Dad was extremely careful in the placement of our box and making absolutely certain it was the exact height, precise placement from the road, etc., to avoid annoying our local postmaster any more than we already had. There are, or at least were, very specific rules about rural mailboxes. Dad followed every single one. That first mailbox was perfect. The man who drove the road grader was as annoyed as the local postmaster, as he now had a new driveway to accommodate. We suspect that's why he had it out for our mailbox. After the road grader had demolished three of our mailboxes, Dad got pissed. Previously, he'd used the most basic design, just a post in the ground with a box on top. Now he was motivated. Dad got hold of a nine-foot-long section of metal pipe. It's four inches in diameter, outer measurement, and has three-quarter-inch thick walls. I have no idea what this was originally intended for, but I know how Dad used it. He dug a hole five and a half feet deep. He welded an upside-down tripod shape, think open umbrella, to the bottom of the pole and dropped it into the six-foot-wide hole. Each welded-on leg was about three feet of some kind of rebar, and there were five such spokes. He then dropped some huge rocks on top of the tripod shape to hold it in place. The empty spaces around the huge rocks were filled in with gravel, and he dumped sand to fill in the air gaps. Then he filled the rest of the hole in with dirt and mounted the mailbox on top of the post. Three days after Dad installed the new mailbox, we heard the road grader coming down the road. Our house is a quarter mile from the road, but we heard the loud clang from inside. We also heard the cursing and swearing from inside. No one went down to look until they heard the road grader drive away. When they did, the box itself was slightly dented on one side, but it was still firmly upright and functional. Three weeks later, we received a bill from the township for a bent grater blade. It was accompanied by a letter informing us that we had caused damage to city property because our mailbox was installed incorrectly. It would need to be moved, and we were liable for a bill of a couple of thousand dollars worth of repairs. Here's where it becomes pro-revenge instead of petty. Recall the fact that the local postmaster was annoyed with us over our battle to get mail delivery? Mom had made a point of each time we reinstalled the mailbox, taking photographs down to the post office, and having the local postmaster sign off approval of the height, placement, etc. She'd done the same with Dad's super post and had documented, signed approval of the box dated the day before the road grader had bent his blade trying to demolish the box. She submitted copies of the invoice for the grader blade, and the letter stating that the damage was our fault because our mailbox was incorrectly placed to the post office. She also submitted copies of the official post office approval of the box to the township. The jerk of a postmaster was also quite prideful, and became furious that his authority was being called into question by some podunk township. As far as he was concerned, the township wasn't questioning my parents. They were stating that his judgment was wrong. I don't know what went down between the postmaster and the township, but we received a second letter from the post office reiterating their approval of our mailbox. We also got a formal apology from the township and noticed that the road grader's contract had been terminated because he'd lied about damage to city property. It was worded with a tone that said, Please don't sue us because a contracted employee damaged your property. For the record, that post Dad installed nearly 40 years ago is still standing. We've replaced the box on top many times, that post, however, has now wrecked two cars and a truck in addition to that long-ago road grader. The next one is a petty revenge story. I live on a street where some houses have driveways, but some of us don't, and we have to park in the street. We had just enough room to park our two vehicles in front of our house. A new neighbor moved in across the street. I'll call her Brittany. Brittany had a tiny Prius and parked in front of our house a lot. She didn't have a driveway. The space in front of her house was almost always empty when this happened. At the time, I had a toddler and a newborn, and getting them into the house was a pain when I had to circle the block and park on the other side of the street, hauling the car seat in one hand while juggling a diaper bag, groceries, and a toddler that hadn't developed a sense of self-preservation yet. The thing that got to me was that there would be plenty of space for two cars to park, 
but Brittany couldn't be bothered to pull forward or scoot back. She usually parked right in the middle so no one else could park near her car. One day, I had had enough. I hauled the baby, the stuff, and the toddler up to her porch and knocked politely on her door. Me? Hey, I live across the street. I was just wondering if you could park in front of your house instead of mine, please. Brittany? Um, that's like really inconvenient for me to drive around the whole block just to park. Me? I know, but as you can see, gesturing to the circus at my feet, I have my hands full. It makes it harder when you park in front of my house. Can you please try parking in front of yours instead? Brittany, look, I'll just park where I want. There's no assigned spaces. Door slam. Oh, it was on. I wasn't sure what my revenge would be, but I knew it would be coming. The opportunity came a couple of days later. I came home and my spouse was already parked in front of her car. But lo, the next door neighbor wasn't home yet. I could park behind her. I'd have to scoot up to make sure there was enough room for my other neighbor. They were innocent in all this. So I pulled up behind them and checked the space. Two feet of room. Back into the car to inch forward some more. Checked again. Still had a good foot. I kept doing this until there were literally inches between our bumpers. And here's the thing. I had two cars at my disposal now, whereas she only had one. So into the spouse's van, I go to inch backwards until they were only inches from kissing bumpers. Perfect. Point of note. Both of my vehicles were old, scratched, and beat up. I probably wouldn't notice another dent in them, but the Prius was pristine. I knew Brittany wasn't likely to risk it. I expected that I would get a knock on the door sometime that evening. But when I took the trash out that night, Brittany and her Prius were gone. She must have executed a 200-point turn to get out. I cackled to myself and went to bed happy. The best part was, she stopped parking on my side of the street after that one incident. I guess she realized it really was more convenient to park on hers. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I work at a nursing home as a QMAP, Qualified Medication Assistant Personnel. We're super short-staffed. For my first two weeks of employment, I had to work seven days a week because there was no other night shift QMAP. Finally, we hired a new person whom we'll call Devin. Devin was useless. I mean, genuinely, truly, wholly useless. The only duty he did was administer medications. We only have to pass one med on the night shift. The rest of the night, he'd either sit on his phone or sleep. He never cleaned, did paperwork, checked on residents, did follow-ups on PRN medications, charted anything, and he even argued with caregivers about who would wipe the ass of bedbound residents. To make it worse, he took most of my shifts. He worked five nights a week as a QMAP while I worked the other two nights, plus three as a caregiver. On the two nights when I was the QMAP, I had to desperately catch up on everything he let pile up through the week. What normally took maybe three hours of work per night suddenly took almost my entire shift. I tried to talk to him multiple times about his lack of work, but it was like talking to a wall. I'd spend 15 minutes begging him to, at the very least, clean the kitchen so we don't get ants or mice, and he'd just nod and say, yeah, I get it, in the most monotone voice. Admittedly, I wound up blowing up at him twice, but I feel like it was deserved because he wasn't caring for the residents and he was dead-ass lying to my face about his work. Everyone, including my boss, knew he was completely useless, but we didn't have enough staff members to fire him. One Saturday, when it was only me as a caregiver, and Devin as the QMAP, I'd been called in earlier to work a double shift because we're short-staffed. Thirty minutes before shift change, I got a call from my boss saying that Devin quit on the spot. To my understanding, the interaction went as follows. Devin. I'm changing my schedule to only working three days. Boss. You can't just change your schedule without talking to us. Devin, then this was my last shift. I quit. So all of a sudden I was left as the only staff member on shift. I had to do the equivalent of three people's jobs. Normally there are two caregivers, but like I said, we're short-staffed. Not to mention I'd already worked eight hours on the evening shift. It was a long, exhausting night. And I'm pretty sure I only got everything done thanks to a multi-hour long adrenaline rush and spite. And I didn't get a break after that because I was once again faced with the fact that I was the only night queue map, so I'd have to work every night until we found someone else. However, after a few nights of consistent work, I remembered how easy work is when you don't have a mountain of crap to get done. Cut to five days ago and I'm having a medical emergency. Without going into too much detail, I have a peg tube and it has been persistently infected and it's gotten worse. I wound up in the hospital and my boss had to cover me that night. 
I came back in the night after, despite feeling like a complete ass. Once I got on the shift, my boss called me with some news. Devin texted her asking for his job back. Turns out he quit without backup income and was facing the consequences of his actions. My boss asked me if I wanted to let him come back since I was sick and still the only night Q map. I weighed my choices and came to the conclusion that, despite feeling like crap and being forced to work every night, it was still less exhausting and strenuous than trying to pick up after Devin. It was a final beautiful petty moment of revenge for the hours of stress and strain he put me through. I got to put the nail in his coffin. The idiot clearly didn't want to work, and in no uncertain terms, he had told our boss that Saturday had been his last day. Who was I to say otherwise? The next one is an entitled people story. I work at a buy-sell-trade toy store that has both new and used toys. We also have a build station where kids can build minifigures. The store is located in a mall, so a woman and her five or so kids, didn't count, came in on a Sunday wanting to make their own minifigures and look around the store. My co-worker and I were more than happy to help them, and they all went to build their figures. We waited patiently, and then, about ten minutes before closing time, we let them know that they had ten minutes before we had to start closing procedures. Side note, there's one day a week when this mall closes early, which means the store closes early as well. They all said that was great, and my co-worker and I went ahead and started cleaning up other areas of the store. After ten minutes, we informed them that we would have to start closing down the store, and we could start ringing them up if they wanted. The woman started to get extremely huffy and asked us why we were rushing them. I explained that our store wasn't allowed to be open longer than the mall was, and that all store employees were supposed to be out at most an hour after closing. We told her she could let her kids finish their figures, and that we would give her ten minutes to do so. When the ten minutes were up, I went over to let her know. We had another conversation about why she couldn't stay longer which turned into a five-minute argument where I was trying to stay calm and she was getting more and more aggressive. I told her she could either check out now or we would have to close. She got extremely angry and had all of her children put all their items into the minifigure-making area and they stormed out. We ended up staying another 20 minutes to clean up after them and finish procedures. The next day, my manager showed me the review she left. Here's what it said, paraphrased. Went in with my kids, unaware they closed early. They had a minifigure table, so I let my kids build some. They didn't let us finish or pay. Instead, they kicked us out and made us take apart our figures. The kids were super sad because we drove out of town to make them. I am extremely unhappy with the rude employees. My coworker and I explained what happened. My manager watched the footage and we did not get in trouble. The next one is an entitled parent story. I, minor, am currently seated on the toilet, writing this in incredible pain. Last night, I was rushed to the ER due to severe stomach pain. I returned with violent diarrhea, and I ended up vomiting blood all over my floor. My mom insists she cannot handle it and that I should, despite the fact that I'm experiencing bloody bowel movements. For over a year, she has been informed multiple times about my need to see a gastrointestinal specialist due to chronic symptoms. Yet she refuses to take me. She believes I am responsible for my condition, even though I'm putting forth my best effort to care for myself while dealing with severe mental illness. Her interpretation of my need for a specialist feels like a you-were-wrong-and-I-was-right situation for her. She claims that eating better would solve everything, despite knowing I'm in recovery from an eating disorder and had pre-existing serious stomach problems. Last night I vomited blood and bile onto my bedroom floor. I'm uncertain how to clean it given that the smell might trigger more vomiting. It's a legitimate biohazard, but she's prohibited me from cleaning it, citing her reluctance to instruct me and promising to handle it herself. However, she made this promise last night, and now, nearly ten hours later, she hasn't even begun to assist with the cleanup or provide instructions. I'm unable to change clothes, sleep, or even put on pants due to the mess in my room. When I ask her to guide me through the cleaning process, she declines. At this juncture, I'm at a loss for what to do. The pain in my stomach has reached a point where it occasionally causes temporary limb paralysis and unconsciousness. Regardless of how severe the situation becomes, she consistently denies the possibility of my having health issues because I'm young. Ironically, she readily visits doctors for minor headaches, yet she disregards repeated referrals from medical professionals to take her own child to a doctor. I fear for my life as the pain intensifies each day, and my ability to digest food has drastically diminished. 
Even drinking water poses a risk of rejection by my body. The next one is an entitled parent story. I can't actually believe this conversation just happened. The sheer entitlement and ridiculousness of it has made me laugh, but it also left me speechless. I ordered a mug from Amazon as a gift for my best mate. The mug had the word idiot on it, with the C as the handle. It's a cute mug and I would recommend it. Anyway, there is a house on the street next to mine that has a very similar address to mine, and I will often get their post, and they sometimes get mine. For example, my address would be something like number 6 Random Street, and theirs is number 6 Random Side Street. It's annoying because they are different by only plus or minus one word, but the names of myself and that family are so wildly different that you would think the postman or any delivery driver might have gotten used to that by now. But I digress. I had the notification from Amazon saying my mug had been delivered and left in a safe place. I go to check, and it isn't there, so I go around to the similar address house to see if it was indeed there, but I get no answer. I decide that I will try again later, and or they will bring it over before I contact Amazon. A few days pass, and they don't bring my parcel around, so I ask Amazon to replace it. But then, half an hour ago, there was a knock on my door. I open the door to the father of the family at the similar address, holding my opened Amazon parcel, and he quite literally throws it at me. Before I can form words, he says, My eleven-year-old child opened that! Don't you ever order something so disgusting again! How dare you! And starts to storm off. I register what the hell he just said, and I shout after him, Wait! What the heck? No one should be opening my post anyway. It's a criminal offense! How dare you have the cheek to come to my house and berate me for opening my post? He just waves his hand at me dismissively and carries on walking. I just stand there for a good minute trying to figure out if that actually happened. Well, it did, and now I have two idiot mugs. I'm so tempted to leave one on his doorstep with a note saying, You can keep it, mate. It's definitely been made for you. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.